Uh, good morning everyone and welcome to the All About Soils webinar brought to you by North Coast Local Land Services. Uh, my name's Kel Langfield, I'm a Senior Land Services Officer with North Coast Local Land Services and I'd like to welcome you here today. I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the traditional custodians of all the nations on which we live, work and play. We pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us today. Uh, today is the first of four webinars on uh, titled All About Soils. So I'll just draw yourselves to a couple of things before we start. Um, each, we're going to break today's session into, um, it's jam-packed, we're going to break it into 15-minute sections with a five-minute question time in between. So please, while you're listening and following along, put your, put your questions into the chat section there. Uh, I'll have a look at them and I'll try where I can to uh, group them up into ones of common common theme, so David uh, can, can answer those for us uh, in question time. Um, so without further ado, I'll introduce David. Uh, David uh, has over 20 years experience in rural landscapes, farming and food systems, and he develops and delivers many of the extension projects for soil, land, food across Australia. Uh, he has a wide ranging career working in management and technical roles, including land care extension, agronomy, soils, agribusiness, biofertiliser, uh, research and development and manufacturing, organics training and consulting. Uh, Dave also teaches soils, regenerative agriculture, farm planning and agroecology at TAFE on a casual basis. Dave's passion is empowering farmers with knowledge and skills that make a difference. So Dave, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks very much, Kel. Thanks for the pretty long-winded introduction. Uh, and uh, yeah, welcome everyone for uh, joining us for this uh, soil webinar all about soils uh, with North Coast, North Coast LLS. Uh, I'll be taking a few through today and it's great to see everyone starting to put a few questions into chat. Jeannie definitely can't probably answer your specific question on mineral balancing and balancing soils today, but we definitely hope through the series that we've got going here that we can help answer that question for you over the next uh, 12 months or so. Uh, today is an introductory session, so yeah, probably for some of you that are already exploring your soil for some time, it might be going back over a few fundamentals. And for those of you that are a bit new to soils, hopefully I set up some foundational ideas for you. But certainly today is day one of a series and we hope to get questions from you today, so please put them into chat. And so if we don't answer them today um, in this introductory day, we can make sure we cover them off you for you through the series. Uh, I'm going to jump straight in now uh, and ex uh, really start the session and it's all about soils uh, and uh, today really what we're going to do is a bit of an introduction to soils uh, and cover some key ideas about how you manage them well, like what are the key skills and key steps you need to follow to get success with your soil management. So. That's really what we're going to do today and we will, as I say, be pretty introductory on everything uh, just for an initial uh, seminar. Uh, today we'll be looking, I'll just introduce you to soils and kind of what I call 21st century thinking around what soils are and how they work. Uh, and then we're going to explore three key concepts with soils and one is soil type, two is soil health and three is soil fertility. So everyone's throwing in their answers in to chat about their soil type, so that's great. We'll get to that in a minute too and hopefully we can clarify it for you a little bit more. Um, so if you have any burning questions, as Cal mentioned, please put them into chat as we go and we'll try to answer them through today or if we don't get them today, um, we'll get to them through the rest of the webinar series. So let's have a brief look at soils and how they work and just introduce you to some key concepts around soils. Um, I guess the first question to ask ourselves is why are soils so important? Uh, whenever you farm or graze, in my opinion, soils are the second most important asset in your farm business. So soils are really, really important, but they're not the most important thing in your farm business. 
the people are the most important asset in your farm business, uh, in my opinion, but soils are a close second. So soil is there 365 days of the year. So far no one's taxing you on it or giving you a license to manage it. So uh, soil is there, it's under your control and it, it's a really important part. It underpins any farming or grazing or general land management and conservation activities that you do. Um, so I guess we can see that soil is pretty much an asset in your business. It's one of your farm's most important assets and we call it a capital asset and here's some country out in southwest uh, Queensland at Charleville on the red dirt there and you can see that it underpins those farms as well, those grazing properties, uh, the soil underpins those uh, success of those businesses. And what we say is that soil is part of your natural capital, that is part of your business. So wherever you are in Australia, like this Tassie dairy farm in uh, North East Tassie or in the north coast of New South Wales or Western Queensland, pretty much it's a pretty fair bet that most soils have issues. From a human point of view, often soils have issues and so the challenge is how do we manage soils, keep them in balance and overcome their issues so we can uh, manage them successfully. Uh, because the key thing about soils is it's really easy to burn money on your soils with either management or inputs. So uh, you can put money into fertilizers or biologicals or soil amendments. It's easy to burn up your money onto it. Uh, but you don't always get a great result or the success that you're aiming for. And so that's the challenge with soils is investing your effort and your money into getting success so that you do get productivity and you know um, long-term sustained profit, I guess, if you're in agriculture. Uh, and so it, that's the challenge we have. The other key aspect, though, of soils is not only can you burn money buying inputs or investing a lot of uh, effort into doing things to your soil, but if your soil's in poor condition, if it's not performing well, then you can be losing potential income. So really, mismanagement of your soil asset, one, you can be overdoing your costs, if you're not spending the money in the right way at the right place to deal with your soil. But two, you could be losing potential income because your plants and pastures and crops are just not growing really well. So that's lost income potential. So soils are really important if you're in commercial agriculture um, because you know you can really affect your profitability if they're mismanaged. So I guess the thing is it's about managing them well and the reason that your soil asset is so important to you uh, and your business is that soils carry out really important functions in the landscape. So, you know, our properties, our grazing properties, our macadamia orchards, etc., they're in landscapes, and soils are kind of like a pivotal part of all landscapes, and they carry out really important functions for us in the landscape. And that's why keeping them in really good health, like this horticultural soil here, which is was on a 30% aluminium soil type or soil situation and they've been able to turn it around. So it's now functioning much better for growing horticulture crops. Um, the first probably really critical function that soils do for us is they capture and store, store water. When rain falls, it either goes into the topsoil or it runs across the topsoil. And we all know that when soil runs across, water runs across the topsoil can lead to erosion. And so the best place to put most of your rainfall is into the topsoil, so that infiltration rate is critical. So having a healthy soil, a high functioning soil, means that your water cycle is optimal. Uh, a second really important reason and function that soils do for us uh, is that they cycle nutrients. If you have a look here, this is a research from the US on planned grazing. And you can see on the right, we've got a, a, a perennial grass that's cut to two inches every four weeks. And you can see just by giving it that longer recovery period, cutting it to two inches every four weeks rather than every week, it's been able to build a much bigger root system. And that's what drives that root system and all the associated biology with the root system is what drives nutrient cycling. So that, that particular uh, site will have much better nutrient cycling than the, um, the side that's been cut every week. And that's a key function that soils do is that they cycle our nutrients through the topsoil and make them available. So a soil in good condition does that really effectively. Another really uh, important function that soils carry out is they provide an optimal environment for plant roots to grow. So you know when you're so this is quite a sandy, low, lower fertility soil type, but it's got high organic matter. It's got good root volume. It's we're, it's the management of that soil has created a good environment for plant roots to express themselves. 
which is really important. So with plants it's not just about what's above ground, photosynthesis and what we want to grow and sell, it's also about underground as well. We can capture more solar energy and build that topsoil. So that's a key function that soils do. Uh, another really important reason that function that soils do is that they minimise or regulate soil borne diseases. So they're definitely in a soil community of life. There are things that like to eat plant roots, our soil pathogens and pests and diseases and a, and a soil that's functioning well keeps those things in check and minimises their impact. A final really important function that topsoils uh, do for us that we sometimes don't think about is they help maintain a healthy landscape. So when I have a healthy soil, I'll have ground cover, I'll have high organic matter, good structure, etc. It leads to some really important outcomes for the landscape in general, such as lower temperature, lower evaporation rates, less dust, less erosion, and improved biodiversity because we've got things like more organisms in the soil, which means more birds can eat those organisms. So pretty much it has really profound effects for the wider landscape when a soil is functioning well. So there's lots of benefits and there's lots of important reasons to keep your soil in good condition uh, and that the reasons that soil are really important to us. So let's briefly have a quick look at how soils actually work and I'm just going to really touch on this because it Obviously soils is a massive topic and some of you have already been probably investigating your soils for some time but I'm just today just going to introduce some key concepts. So I guess the 21st century view of soil is that your topsoil is a community. So it's not just chemistry and structure and biology or kind of kind of in separate silos if you like. Actually a soil is an ecosystem or what we call a system and that system is at the heart of it is a community and that community is made up of soil microbes, soil organisms and plant roots. So that community of life includes the microbes, the ones we can't see, the organisms that we can see like the insects and earthworms and plant roots are part of that community as well. And here's a, a wheat plant from western New South Wales near Ningen and you can see that young wheat plant and the soil around it are creating this community uh, what we call the rhizosphere, uh, which is setting that young plant up for the season. And we're talking about a very low rainfall, pretty extreme variable cropping area of New South Wales. And so that young plant and the soil is setting up uh, a community to help everyone survive the coming season, if you like. So for all, over 400 million years, plants have co-evolved with this community of soil life, like they've evolved together. So they completely depend on each other, whether it's a macadamia tree or perennial pasture or an annual vegetable or a sweet potato crop. Pretty much plants and the, the community of life in their soil have, have evolved together so they completely depend on each other, a bit like we depend on the microbes in our stomach, the human microbiome if you like, in our guts to help us digest our food. And so that part of that relationship with the two partners, the soil life and the plants, that co-evolution, there's kind of two parts to it. The first part is that plants photosynthesize, which means they capture energy from the sun and convert it into a form of chemical energy based on carbohydrates. Uh, and they do that, they create biomass. And you can see here the grass on the right has a lot more above ground and below ground biomass than the plant on the left, which is managed differently. So plants create this thing called biomass which essentially they've captured energy from the sun and turned it into carbohydrates uh, and much of that energy then becomes or that biomass becomes soil organic matter whether it's roots on the underground or it's litter on the surface that then feeds the soil with this organic matter which has energy in it. Uh, and so in return the microbes which need energy or carbohydrates they use that organic matter for their energy, they decompose it but they're really good, particularly the microbes, at accessing nutrients. So they can then access nutrients with the energy that they've got and that microbial life then accesses nutrient elements from soil minerals and makes them available to plants. So there's kind of like a two-way deal. Plants bring in energy, the microbial population in the soil accesses nutrients from minerals which is where most of the nutrients on earth are and they in return supply them to plants and that's kind of been that's the heart of the relationship going on in the soil. There's a bit more to it, but in a nutshell today, that's really what it is at the heart of it. 
Uh, so in your soil, if you like to think about it, it's a network of relationships. It's a complex network of relationships uh, and between the members of the soil community and plants. Basically modern, you know, that's the modern thinking of soils. Um, along with soil minerals, soil air and soil water. So we have to throw them in the mix as well. So it's a pretty, com it sounds like a complex recipe or complicated recipe and it is a bit complex but to keep it simple, it's, a rela it's just a whole lot of relationships going on all at the same time with billions and billions of microbes, tens of thousands of soil organisms, hundreds of kilometres of fungal hyphae and roots all going on the climate influencing it, rainfall influencing it, humans coming along and doing their thing. So you can see it's a bit of a complex system and I guess our goal is to juggle it all and keep it in balance. So that complex system, if you like, and I guess this is really where we're going in the 21st century when we talk about things, uh, self-organising is the term we use, uh, that if you think of your soil as a complex system, that whole system of microbes, plant roots, minerals, etc organises or self-organises itself into what we call a topsoil. So whenever you look at a topsoil, it's the result of all those relationships in a certain equilibrium. And we can keep that equilibrium in balance or we can throw it out. But basically in a balanced situation, that, that whole system organises an optimal environment because it doesn't really make sense for the whole topsoil community to organise an environment that's not beneficial for itself. So plants, all the soil life and all the minerals, everything organic matter, it all organises into a kind of optimal environment. And here's a forest soil and you can see the litter on top, the leaf litter. This soil is really uh, created from the top down, if you like, a forest soil from all the leaf litter. And in that top soil, it's full of the feeder roots of the trees along with th fungi, bacteria and lots of soil organisms. And they've created this forest topsoil which suits everyone in the forest community. So our challenge as land management as, or farmers or graziers is to really maintain this topsoil system in a balanced state. So here you can see in a sugarcane paddock on the left you've got um, a soil that's got good structure and it's being managed well and on the right we've got a soil that's heavily compacted, it's lost its air, it's lost its function, it's got low root volume. So really the challenge is to try and maintain your topsoil in a balanced state um, and also to maintain a level of fertility that you need for your agricultural or landscape goals. So the level of nutrients in a soil depends is dependent a little bit on what you're aiming to do. But no matter what you're aiming to do, you need to keep your soil functioning well and keep it in a balanced state. So that's really what we call soil health. So that's our challenges, keep our soil healthy and keep the right amount of fertility for our goals. So I guess uh, in summary of this little mini introduction to soils and sort of the 21st century approach to looking at them, there's three core management skills if you like that you really need to think about uh, if you're not confident in managing your soil that you need to practice and build. And the first one is how to understand your different soil types. Hence we asked you that question and everyone's put in some really great answers about the different soil types. So here's some guys on the New England near Urala, Walker that are looking at the different soil types around there and as you can see from the map there's plenty of different soil types and if we got down to the paddock scale there'd be even more. So understanding soil types and your different soil types is a really important management skill and so too is managing soil health which is this second key skill, keeping your soil in good condition. So um, you know, during the webinar series we'll really explore that in depth and it's not just the physical and chemical aspects of soil health but of course the biological aspects are really important as well. And finally that third key skill that everyone really focuses on in modern agriculture and that is managing fertility or managing nutrients, buying fertilisers. It's a really important skill but actually the other two skills in my opinion are more important because I can have all the fertilisers I like but if my soil doesn't have any air and the roots aren't growing into it, well then the fertilisers aren't being used. So actually soil fertility management comes after those first two skills but it is a really important skill and again we'll be exploring that through the webinar series as well. So I guess I'll pull it up at that point. I know I'm scooting along but we're basically, yeah, it is a bit of an introductory webinar series and um, just to give you that overview of soils and how they function and it just 
grab a few minutes to, for me to have a break and see if there's any burning questions. So does anyone have any burning questions uh, about that first section there about how soils work and soils as a system um, or that relationship between plants and the soil community? Uh, if so, please punch them into chat now and we can uh, cover them off for you. And sorry everyone that one of these couple of these presentations have bumped around. I think it's a question of copying them from one format to another and we've lost a little bit of the formatting. Uh, I think there's a few people chatting, so we'll give everyone one or two more minutes, Kel, and then we might keep going. Matt's got a good question in there. It's not a stupid question, Matt, at all. Matt's question in there is there about is there generally a certain depth that is considered a topsoil? Matt, that's a really, really, really good question. It's not a stupid question at all. I guess the, the key, it is a key question, is what is topsoil? My definition of a topsoil is the area of soil strongly under the influence of plant roots and their activity. So if you just think about the area of your soil strongly under the influence of plant roots and their activity, when we drive around and look at soils, you know, you're driving along and you see a road cutting or you're out in the paddock and you dig a spade out, it's pretty clear where the topsoil kind of starts and stops. And that's because it's, there's a visual distinction and, and also there's a complete change in the chemistry and the life between the topsoil and the subsoil. But it's pretty much the area where the majority of your roots stop growing. So there may be some deeper roots chasing down, but a uh, very important question because most of the time we worry about topsoil when we're managing soils, but every now and again subsoils come back to bite us. So it is an important thing to know where your topsoil starts and finishes. Uh, yes, yeah, Simon, there's different numbers. Simon's question there is about how much percentage of the carbohydrates that plants create during photosynthesis are pumped into the soil in the form of sugars. Uh, you know, and not put into plant growth. And so, I mean, you will see different figures, but I think as a rule of thumb, you can say, and it depends on the situation, the plant, the environment, where you are, the climate, etc. But if you say somewhere between 10 and 30%, you're probably somewhere on the money, if that makes sense. So um, if that gives you a rough rule of thumb, Simon, hopefully that helps out. Um, uh, Kirsten, that's a big one about the importance of soils for human gut health. This is an introductory session, so I'm not going to go too much further than that. Not that I don't want to, but I'm just mindful of time. But I'm happy to come back on that later, and there are some really interesting sort of uh, ideas and, and science that explore that a bit more. But I'm just going to dodge that, not because I don't want to, but because of time. Uh, and Jeannie, we're definitely going to cover throughout the webinar series different ways to explore your soil health and measure it objectively, including biological ways as well. So, um, yep, and Camilla there, I'll do one more, Cam Camilla's one there about the link between soil health and carbon sequestration. So basically, Camilla, yeah, today we don't have great, we'll definitely be able to cover it next time when we look at the carbon and the organic matter cycle in depth. But basically, as carbon gets sequestered, it gets turned into humus. That's another name for humus formation. It's just a fancy modern name for humus formation. So as some of your carbon in your soil's organic matter turns into humus, it gets sequestered into a stable form, and that has really important benefits for soil structure, soil water holding capacity, and nutrient dynamics as well as that self-regulating equilibrium of the soil. So, for example, helping balance pH by buffering, um, which is what humus does. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of an answer there, Camilla. No worries. So I'm just going to keep rolling, everyone, because we've only got uh, an hour or so. And as you guys know, soils is a massive topic. And hopefully any questions that we miss, Kel and myself can I see them at the end of the session. So let's jump into soil types, um, different soil types. And everyone that's answered the question has at least, well, we've got someone with one soil type, a Krasnozem, but most people have more than one soil type. And you've all given them names like alluvials or shales or granites or basalts, etc. So um, here, this is Bob Harris in the centre there. He's a grazier from central Queensland. And when we did our grazing workshop up there a few years ago for a barrier reef project, uh, before we got there, Bob, Bob had gone around his property and got every single soil type and laid it out on a table for us because he wanted to know why his different soil types grew grass differently, responded to rain differently, and were just very different, why they were so different in their behaviour and their, their productivity potential. So. 
Bob really wanted to know more about his soil types, which was a fantastic way for us all to start learning. And so I guess the question we gave you guys at the beginning was how many soil types do you have on your place and what names do you give your soil types and thanks for throwing those answers in. Uh, when I went to the Northern Territory last year, I think it was, uh, to do some workshops up there, I'd never been to the Northern Territory and I was doing a soil series so I had to ask them about their soils because I didn't know about them and they said, Dave, we've got three soil types, yellow shit, white shit and red shit. So I wouldn't recommend you call your soils that, but basically what they were trying to tell me is that they've got very low fertility soil types um, of different colours. And so you can see people have different names for their soil types, um, but basically let's have a look at what is, <laughs> get a bit more specific and scientific about it and practical about defining the aspects of your soil type. So if you think about the soil types on your place, they, the soil types in anywhere on earth really comes from the rocks that the soils form from. So they originate from the rocks. So here's a picture of a young soil in the Hunter, this is on the Liverpool range between the Liverpool Plains and the Hunter Valley if anyone's been on the Merriwar Willow Tree Road. And so that's a young soil that's still forming and you can see the young topsoil because it's still full of rocks. So we haven't got a, like a mature topsoil yet. Um, but basically those rocks are breaking down and that's the, that's the start of your soil type. So through a pro process called weathering, rocks break down into minerals. So here's a granite, belt, a granite soil up near Tenderfield. So those granite rocks have broken down into minerals and it's those minerals um, that are keep breaking down into smaller minerals and then some of them get changed into clays and silts. So we've got this weathering of rocks uh, down into secondary minerals and then we end up with different sort of types of particles of minerals in your soil. And it's these minerals that really define your soil type. It's the minerals that really give your soil important characteristics, uh, along with how old the minerals are, how long they've been weathered for, the topography, the vegetation. These things also influence the type of minerals and therefore your soil type to some extent as well. And you can see here this is a soil near Walker and if you look carefully at the creek line you'll see a kind of mid-brown colour overlaying a dark colour. It's a little bit hard to see with the photo but there's a mid-brown colour on the top of the gully edge and then down to a, a darker colour and that darker colour was originally the topsoil depth pre-European times and there's a, a new minerals have come in uh, from the hill slopes to create a kind of new topsoil, what we call a post-settlement alluvium. So and that's an example of topography and land management influencing soil type. So which characteristics of a soil come mostly from its minerals? That's the big question. Here's a Hunter Valley vineyard about to plant a uh, vineyard, uh, new vineyard on uh, a different soil type. Uh, which characteristics come mainly from its minerals? Well there's four big ones. There are a few other things but there are four big ones that come from the minerals and that is colour which pretty much everyone's pretty familiar with the colours of soils like this red soil out near Bow Ranald. And you'll notice where I'm standing there, it's in the shadow, but there's white mottling. You can see bits of white in that soil as well. So the colour is coming from the minerals. The mineral composition, or what we call the overall fertility, has come from the minerals. The texture and a soil's colloid. So really they're the main aspects of your soil type and that's what we'll just briefly explore now. So mineral composition is also sometimes known as the total fertility. It's the level of the nutrients in a soil, not just the available nutrients, like what's available now for this season, but the total that may be less available or more slowly cycling, which we sometimes call unavailable. And if you have a look at that table, I've got three different, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six different soils from across Eastern Australia. Uh, and you can see that the first soil, which is a black cracking soil, has a calcium level of 5,000 and 38 parts per million in the topsoil, whereas the soil number 5 across the last, second last soil has a total calcium of 85. And if you look at phosphorus, the first soil has a total phosphorus of 1,294 and the last soil has a total phosphorus of 74. So you can see that different soil types, depending on their minerals, have different levels of different mineral compositions or levels of fertility. So they've got different potentials for agriculture basically and that's, that, that overall mineral composition doesn't change much. We can certainly add fertilisers to it but it's really that long term property. The second aspect of soil type that your soil inherits from its minerals is 
the soil's texture, which hopefully some of you are familiar with. That's the feel of a soil and it's pretty much the proportion of sand, silt and clay particles in your soil that gives it either that greasy feel or a gritty feel or a really smooth feel. So the texture of your soil uh, comes from the minerals. Uh, and then the final one that we'll just touch on today, and it is a bit of a technical topic which we'll get to later, and that's what's called the soil colloid, which is also known as the soil's cation exchange capacity, and you may have come across the jargon CEC, or cation exchange capacity, and it's pretty much an electrostatic charge in your soil. So it's not mysterious, it sounds a bit mysterious, but your soil actually has a charge in it, uh, and no, it's not influenced by lightning, so if you're about to type that in, I've already had that one before. Not that I'm aware of, maybe it is influenced by lightning, but I don't know about that. But it's a charge, particularly on your clay and on humus, and it's, it's a charge that's a property of things called colloids, and humus and clay are both types of colloids. So it gives your soil a charge, and that has very important, that, that influences a lot of important aspects of your soil, especially if you're in horticulture or cropping and you're using inputs. So your soil's type has basically three main aspects to it along with colour and that is the total fertility or the mineral composition which is that long term fertility potential, a certain texture and a certain size charge in your soil. And so you can ask yourself, sorry this slide's gone a bit haywire as we change the format, you can ask yourself what your soil type is by saying well what is its texture? Uh, is it sandy clay or loamy? What is its colloid or CEC size? Is it small, medium or large? And what's its overall fertility? Is it a low fertility soil like some of those Northern Territory soils which they use the four letter word for? Or is it a high fertility soil like that flat cracking soil and some of the floodplain soils of the Northern Rivers fall into that category? So you've got soil, different soil types and the key thing about soil types is that your soil type doesn't change much under management. Um, you, can, you, you, you can influence it a little bit, particularly the cation exchange capacity, but overall your soil type is what you have. But knowing your soil type is important because it influences every farm management decision you'll ever make on that area. So, you know, Bob is grazing his different soil types differently because one, for one thing they respond differently to rain, they have different pasture species on them which grow at different times or different levels of graze, uh, growing potential. The cow and the cow, the impact of cows on the different soil textures will also influence things. So soil type's important to know. Once you know your soil type, though, you don't need to check it every year, um, but it does influence everything you do. It's not good or bad. Some people will complain they're on sandy soil. Other people will complain they're on heavy clay soil. It just is what it is, and you have to live with it. And the key thing is to understand your soil type because a key management principle of what I call regenerative soil management is to match your enterprise to your soil type. There's no point growing potatoes on coarse granite soil. Well, you can grow them, but whether it's economic to do that is another matter. You might have to put a lot of work into growing them well. You can get away with it. Um, so that's a really important point, matching what you do to your soil type, because it's easier to do that than change your soil type to change your enterprise. So in grazing soil landscape, in grazing landscape, soil type influences the type of pastures that will grow, as well as the grazing behaviour of livestock. You know, the nutritional value of grasses will differ even in one paddock between areas uh, that, that have higher calcium, for example, just maybe up the corner of the paddock. Well, that, that over time will influence grazing behaviour as well as pasture composition. And in cropping, it's important, and horticulture, it's important to understand soil type because it influences what crops you grow, water and irrigation, tillage decisions, fertiliser use and yield potential. All of these things are um, influenced by, under, by your soil type. So it's important to know soil type. Um, so that's a bit of a summary about soil type um, and the key aspects of soil type. Because we often refer to soil types by either the geology of the area or the colour or the feel of the soil, like heavy soil or brown soil. But there's four key aspects to it and, and knowing those aspects just helps you, you know, fine tune and improve your management of soil. Are there any burning questions on soil type um, while I'm, um, yeah, uh, sorry again about that format of that slide, but we're, yeah, this one we'll just have a bit of a break, uh, give you time to breathe. Hopefully the pace is okay. I'm just, again, mindful that we're 
we're on a bit of, bit of a one hour session here and we're trying to cover a bit of ground. But yeah, any burning questions on soil type, please throw them into chat. Um, don't forget that we will have an opportunity you know, through the 12 months to explore things more. So if you haven't got a question now but one pops in your mind later, then yeah, um, send it through. Okay, I might keep going then, just for mindful of time, but feel free to throw questions into chat as we go through. So now I'm going to jump into the uh, second key aspect of soil, which is soil health, which is probably this really um, broad term. Um, which we widely use now, soil health, but it's a very wide and loose term. So we're going to try and get a little bit more specific about what soil health is. And here's an erosion issue on the north coast in an orchard, which is you know one of the challenges for these landscapes. Um, and fixing erosion, you know, erosion is part of soil health. So going back to address soil health is a key, key um, uh, part of it. Uh, there's a few questions that have just popped in there, Jeannie. Look. Yes, we'll definitely get some links. The LLS have put together some really good fact sheets with Judy Earle on soils for the North Coast from last year, which are great readings that we'll get to as, as well. Uh, and Matt, the scale, like Matt, soil mappers work, he, Matt's question is about spatial scale and soil types. Um, yes, they are, but it's definitely worth going to the property scale, Matt. When you're, when you're, when you're managing on a property scale, it's definitely trying to worth trying to map your soil types to the property scale because a lot of the mapping wasn't done to that specific scale in many areas. Um, but they are useful to help get you started. And Rebecca's question there is, an, is there an opportunity to get recording of this later as it's cutting in and out? I believe there will be Rebecca, so, but the guys will be on that. Yes, I think that's that will be available for you. So let's jump into soil health. So here's a picture of a vehicle and just imagine that we're going along to buy this vehicle. It's a second hand uh, picture. Thanks Mindy. Second hand picture, a second hand vehicle. Here's a photo of it. So when you're going to buy a vehicle like this, I guess there's going to be a few things in your mind about what condition it's in because you want, before you spend money on it, you want to know what condition it's in. So there's pretty much going to be a bit of a checklist going on. Um, there's pretty much a checklist going on about your soil, uh, this vehicle when you go to look at it. So you might be looking for body condition, how many wheels are on it, tyres, the gearbox, oil leaks, does it blow black smoke? Well in this case does it even have an engine in the engine block? So when you're looking at a vehicle or the condition of a vehicle, you pretty much have a bit of a mental checklist that you're going to go through. If you're an NRMA insurance broker, or person, you might have a written checklist and you'll be going through that checklist to see whether that vehicle is in good condition or not. And so no matter what type of vehicle it is, whether it's this renovator's delight or whether it's a reasonably new second hand vehicle, reasonably recent second hand vehicle, before you buy it you want to know if the asset is in working order and can do a job for you. So you're not going to worry too much about putting fuel in the tank because you can put petrol in the tank later on. But if you don't have wheels on it, then putting petrol in the tank is just a waste of time. So that's the difference between soil health and soil fertility is that soil fertility is like putting fuel in the tank. Soil health is like fixing or making sure the asset is in working order. So a ute, if a ute's in good condition, then it carries out key jobs for you. So that's why you want to give it a bit of a checklist. It can carry loads, can get you to town and back can carry passengers, it can tow things, etc. So you need to keep the ute in good condition so it can do that job for you. Um, and the key thing of course too is that it needs to be able to do that job both in the easy times but also in the challenging conditions. You know, it's, in, it's on the really rough road in the drought or in the flood when the creek's flooded that you need to be able to get to town so that vehicle doesn't, you don't want the vehicle breaking down. So that's a key aspect of work, the vehicle's condition. So the soil, think about your soil as an asset in the same way as a vehicle. It's an asset, it's a capital asset as I mentioned before and your soil needs to be maintained in good condition. Here's some guys spreading compost out near narrow mine to improve the soil's condition, in this case water holding capacity and soil structure. But you need to keep that soil in good condition if it's going to be productive in the long term. So just like a vehicle, you've got to keep it in working order, you've got to keep your soil in working order. So soil health is really just another way of saying the condition of your, your soil, is it in working order or not, um, or is it stuffed? And so 
in a nutshell, and this is just a brief summary for today, but you can think about soil health as your soil having a good structure, balanced soil biology, balanced soil chemistry, and I don't mean fertility, but things like pH and salinity, and adequate soil organic matter. So it needs kind of these four things at a minimum to be re functioning reasonably well, um, because as we've seen before, when your soil is in good condition, it carry out, carries out those key functions of capturing and storing water, cycling nutrients, providing a good environment, and supporting plant health. So we need a soil in good condition. So no matter what soil type you have, whether you're on alluvial flats or you're in the hilly country grazing animals up the back, they need to be kept in good condition. So it, the fertility level, how much phosphorus you need, will depend completely on your enterprise and your goals, your financial goals. But no matter whether you're doing low input grazing or high input grazing, you need to keep the soil functioning well. It needs air, it needs water, it needs structure for roots to grow. It needs chemistry balance. So you can have different levels of fertility, but they all need to have good structure for roots to grow into. So that's, that's the key. No matter what soil type you're on, you need to keep it in good health unless you're growing lichens on rocks. If you're growing lichens, then you just can use rocks, but otherwise you need a properly structured, healthy topsoil. So in the same way that we had a checklist for our vehicle, when you're talking soil health, there's a little bit of a checklist that you can use to assess the condition of your topsoil. Is my topsoil in good condition? Is it healthy? So here's part of the checklist, and it includes having enough organic matter or carbon in it, um, which again, we're going to explore these in, in more detail through the webinar series and from the resources that we can link you to. Does your soil have the good balance of carbon to nitrogen in its organic matter? So that's what we call the quality of our organic matter. Is it okay? Just because I have the right, a good quantity of organic matter, it's also got to have the good quality. Uh, soil pH, soil salinity, the cation balances, again, is the, ca the balances of the exchangeable cations in a reasonable proportion. Uh, and then the checklist has a few more things to it, including ground cover and litter, soil structure, surface condition, uh, root activity, volume and depth, root health, and the soil biology, which is a little bit harder to measure. So that includes the diversity of soil organisms and microbes in the soil. Is the community balanced? So this, that's pretty much in a nutshell. I know that doesn't sound like much, but each one of them is obviously a fair bit to it. But that's pretty much the checklist that you can use to see whether your soil is healthy and functioning reasonably well. Because when it's out of order, when, when you have one of those things out of their balance or out of your target, then you have what's called a soil constraint. Like when the soil is too compacted, it has poor structure. And so the, um, the soil won't be in equilibrium. So our challenge when managing soil health is to overcome soil constraints or support the soil to self-organize itself and overcome those soil constraints or minimize those soil constraints and keep itself in equilibrium. So if you think about your soil as a bit of an active partner, which is a bit different than what I call 20th century soil management, where you kind of think of soil as passive and you add stuff to it and fix it, um, you definitely need to add stuff to it and help improve soils. But I think the 21st century view is that the living part of the soil and the plant roots can actually help you uh, regain equilibrium. So if you think about yourself as a partner working with your soil rather than working on your soil like it's a corpse, it sometimes helps, although sometimes soils are pretty poor condition and they are, do act like corpses. Anyway, so that's soil health. So uh, again, sorry for the format collapse. Are there any burning questions at this point around soil health? Just a quick couple of questions. I think we've got time before we jump into our third section and hopefully everyone the pace is okay. But if you have a burning question on soil health, please throw it in now and we can try and answer a couple of questions. We've got a little bit of time before our last little session. Uh, and I saw Andy Vinter. Yeah, East Bay's good, Andy. Uh, again, it's also good to go to the paddock scale, especially if you're doing uh, sort of high intensive horticulture. Uh, bare soil. So, Kirsten, without obviously knowing the context, um, yeah, obviously something is inhibiting plants to grow, I guess is pretty pretty straight answer. Uh, and the challenge will be, Kirsten, identifying why the plants aren't growing. So what's the 
constraint or the limiting factor which is inhibiting plants from growing. And so that's where you use the checklist, Gerson. and you go through the checklist to troubleshoot and go, well, is it soil structure or is it salinity or is it the grazing management? Or you go through the checklist and go, okay, this seems to be the reason. And that's exactly what you do when you're managing soil health. You go through a bit of a troubleshooting checklist. Uh, Lucas, yeah, great. Thanks, Lucas. Yeah, and we'll certainly introduce the soil health cards. Lucas has said the soil health cards. So the Northern Rivers Soil Health System developed by Soilco is a great way. Yes, and there's lots of good YouTube videos, uh, Lucas, as well. Uh, and uh, a soil test, obviously, is the other key core skill. Using a soil test and field assessment. Thank you, Lucas. Uh, and we've got this new system called the Rapid Assessment of Soil Health, or RASH, which is kind of like a um, next generation soil health card system, Lucas, which we'll introduce to, um, which we've been using in different uh, parts of Australia. Um, uh, Kirsten, I've heard there's some kind of animal that lives in the soil and makes it bare. Yeah, it's called human beings. So no, I'm just kidding, Kirsten. I haven't got time to go any further, Kirsten, but this human beings are well known to make soils bare. and <laughs> It's one of our main problems when it comes to soil management. Okay, I'm going to keep going, everyone, just because we are running out of time. And let's jump into the third key aspect of soil soils and their management, and that is soil fertility. So obviously, in a lot of 20th century agriculture, soil fertility was really front and centre. So we often worried about, do I have enough phosphorus or I need to add fertilisers or we need to have fertility for plant growth to get production and feed the world, which is all really important and valid. But I guess what we really realise now and what I'm calling 21st century soil understanding is that just as important is having a soil that's um, self-organising and maintaining equilibrium and in a balanced state, which we now call soil health. Uh, and that nutrients and nutrients won't cycle effectively unless I have unless I've overcome my soil constraints. So I can put all the fertilizer I like on, but if I've got bare ground or compaction or aluminium at 50%, then those nutrients aren't going to be used well. So soil fertility is kind of like a really important third aspect of soil, but it's important not to forget the first two. I guess is my message. So let's jump into soil fertility and do a little bit of a summary of it. So soil fertility is the level of nutrients in a soil. So whether it's phosphorus, nitrogen, sulfur, zinc, etc. Now I'm not distinguishing at this point whether they're available or unavailable. Initially your soil has an overall level of nutrients, some of which are cycling, some of which are not cycling very actively. Um, but that's the key thing is that each soils have a different level in different landscapes, have different levels of fertility. So going back to our soil type picture, if you remember that uh, part of your soil type is mineral composition. So your soil's fertility mainly comes from the rocks that your soil forms from because most elements on planet Earth, most nutrient elements are stored in the Earth's crust. So they're stored in rocks, rocks break down to minerals and then those minerals have nutrients in them. Except for particularly nitrogen, uh, sulfur is a little bit of a mixed nutrient too, but nitrogen doesn't live in rocks. Generally, the nitrogen in your soil and that plants access and that we all access for protein generally comes from the air. So with some exceptions, most elements live in rocks. Uh, and through that process of weathering, the rocks break down to minerals, as we've seen. And it's the soil minerals that really determine your soil's fertility, as we've seen. And because these minerals contain nutrient elements, and here's a very light granite soil with low fertility, um, and that's what we call our mineral composition. And so different soils have different mineral compositions or levels of fertility because they come from different rocks. So obviously that's pretty self-evident. Um, and so they have different, not just levels of nutrients, but balances or proportions of nutrients. So through time, the minerals in the topsoil continue to break down. And at a certain point, and that breakdown happens through environmental reasons like rainfall and natural acidity in particular in Australia and the North Coast in particular, but also biological breakdown processes by microbes, by tree roots, etc. So we've got this breakdown of minerals. And at a certain point, nutrients get released into the topsoil and become available. So that's partly a passive process, environmental weathering, and it's partly an active process driven by plant roots and their microbial partners. So plant roots and their microbial partners actively drive nutrient cycling. It's not a passive. They haven't been waiting 400 million years plants to go, gee, someone come along and feed me. But there is a natural weathering aspect to nutrient cycling too. So at a certain point, the minerals get, the nutrient elements get released from minerals 
and get made available for the whole community from plants to microbes to soil organisms to herbivores to humans and we can access nutrients as we eat each other. And so at that point the nutrients then cycle around in the topsoil. The, the, your topsoil when it's functioning well has a high nutrient cycling capacity between soil life, plants, animals, back to minerals, into the air, etc., into the water. So nutrients then cycle in the topsoil and that's why topsoils are so important. It's where nutrients cycle on earth. It's, it's one of the main kind of uh, clearing houses for nutrients on earth between the atmosphere, the mineral, the geology and life as topsoil is the kind of the main facilitator. So I guess in a nutshell with this cycling of nutrients in a topsoil, our main goal as land managers or farmers or graziers is to try and achieve adequate and balanced available nutrient levels for your farm enterprise goals. So if, you're, if you don't want to put any fertilizers out then there's a certain level of fertility that you can achieve for your pastures or crops by just optimizing whatever's already there to cycle really well. Um, but you may want to add more nutrients in to change that fertility level and that's obviously where we use fertilizers. So, but I could also improve the cycling of what I already have there in terms of nutrients. But that's our main goal is to try and achieve adequate and balance for your farm enterprise. So that may be different if you're on macadamias or you're growing sugarcane or you're grazing cows or you've got a dairy, you know, that what, what determines adequate and balance depends a bit on your farm enterprise, a lot on your farm enterprise and also your economic goals. So that's why fertility is quite distinct from soil health in some ways because no matter what enterprise you have, you have to keep your soil in good health but the level of fertility is going to be very much dependent on what you're trying to achieve economically. So hopefully that gives you a bit of a feel for nutrients. I know I've only just touched on that but again through the webinar series we hope to investigate soil fertility with you and the management of it uh, a fair bit more. Uh, and so at that point I'm just going to pull it up and just yeah throw it open again to everyone if you've got any burning questions and we'd really like you to throw any questions you have that we may not get to today um, like that question on the link between human nutrition and soils uh, but we hopefully can cover it through the course for you. So I guess now's the opportunity for you to definitely put in some questions on the immediate topics that we've really just touched on around soils but also uh, any broader questions that you'd like to investigate through the webinar series so Kel and me can really make sure that we try and target them for you as we do some more webinars through the next 12 months. Otherwise I'd like to say thank you very much for uh, participating today. We had 80 people so that's fantastic. Um, I'm trying to improve my graphic design and my photo <laughs> presentation so hopefully I'll get better next time. It's all been a bit new for me, this COVID thing as well. I much prefer hands-on presentation with uh, out in the paddock. Um, but I guess the, what I'll leave you with is three kind of key ideas to help um, to think about if you want to improve your soil management. And the first one is to really build your soil knowledge up, just to, which obviously you're doing by attending today but um, listening to podcasts, reading stuff build your soil knowledge up, um, build up your soil skills which is you know those core skills of reading soil tests and assessing soils in the paddock using soil health um, tests etc. Uh, and then practicing the other key skill which is sometimes neglected is practicing how to make better soil decisions and that might sound a bit strange but listening to how other farmers made successful soil decisions, uh, sharing ideas with other landholders, that's a really important way to practice making better soil decisions because as we sort of mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, it's really easy to burn a lot of money on soils so it's better to make better decisions because that way you'll spend the money in the right way at the right time. Great, so on that note I'll just say thank you uh, and Kel, I'll hand back to Kel. We've got a few questions that have popped in there so Kel, I've just been rolling with them because there wasn't too many. So no, that's good, David. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. We did miss one there earlier from Andy about um, soil names and soil types. So, yes. Should people name their soils by the soil description, e.g., e clay loam, or is it better to use the correct name of the soil type? Yeah. Great. So, yeah. So, Andy, I mean, for me, the best way to call your soil is something that has meaning for you, and I know that might sound a bit strange, but, um, but, but also, yeah. So. The, you could use the, so Australia has a something called the soil orders or the Australian classification system 
which has these different orders of soils or, or classes of soils at a very broad level. So, you know, the vertisols or the um, ferrosols, the high iron red soils, of which there's a few around the north coast. So it has these broad things, but from a practical management point of view, um, in my opinion, it's those four, three or four key aspects of CEC texture and mineral composition that that from a day-to-day -day management point of view, but if you, you know, as long as you understand that they're influencing your management of the soil type of that soil and, and that they're kind of the constraint you have to manage within, then what name you give it for me is sort of secondary. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. But often people do use the texture to talk, like they'll go clay loam. But then you'll see people will go alluvial or my river flat soils. So, you know, I don't think there's a wrong or a right as long as you're aware of those key aspects of soil type because that's what's influencing management. So hopefully that gives you a bit of an answer, Andy. Um, but if you're a soil scientist, um, then, you know, obviously they, they more focus on soil orders and using those formal classifications of the Australian Soil Classification Scheme, which are really important and, and can, they are useful to sort of understand them as well for sure. Uh, no worries. So we've got a few, hopefully that helps you, Andy. So I'm just going to cover off the last few questions that have popped in there. We've got a few minutes, I think. So Kathy's put in there, if you build up your topsoil with carbon and green waste, oh, sorry, that just bumped down with another question. Uh, how do you add minerals if they are a long way down in your soil if you don't, and also you don't mention much about water? Yes, yeah, so Kathy, it's an introductory session and I only had 60 minutes and it's a big topic. So sorry I didn't mention more about water, but yeah, it was, I had to scoot through a few things. So hopefully we can dig into that a bit more for you. Um, regarding the second point, what you'll find in a forest soil, which um, I had that one picture, but next time I'll show you some other pictures of that when we talk organic matter. But basically, um, the mineral, the mineral fraction that's underneath that sort of high carbon or humus layer, if we can call it that, which you will see in an intact forest as well, the mineral fraction underneath that, which is where most of the nutrient elements start from, do get cycled up into that layer through plant roots as well as soil organisms moving up and down. So it's called bioturbation. So you, you do get this up and down cycling of nutrients from the mineral layer up into the humus layer, if that kind of gives you a short answer. Um, yeah, so um, you can, yeah, but there's also nutrients being added in your green waste as well as a second thought. So Cathy Hope, uh, Sharon, where do you, if you have compacted soils, where do you start? Well, you can build a road, road on it, Sharon. No, I'm just kidding. Sharon, the main thing is to try and get air and water into it initially. So whatever you need to do to get air and water into it. So in severe compaction, then sometimes ripping is, is useful or just breaking the ground open so that you can get air and water in. Once you've got air and water in, then plants, managing plants is, is the next key thing because it's the plants and their roots that will restructure your soil. Well, and, and how they drive that soil community that, that leads to re-aggregation of your soil and the pores and the structure. So air and water is the first step and depending on the situation you may need to physically rip or break up. But once you're getting air and water in, then plants and their roots is the key next tactic. Without seeing the situation specifically, Sharon, that's the best I can do. Thanks, Sarah, for that feedback. Thank you, Jeannie. Uh, Lucas, great, no worries. Thanks for that. Uh, no worries. Uh, Peter's put something in there. Oh, yep, sorry, Peter, I just scrolled down. If we talk about regenerative farming, then isn't it the reduced use of fertilizer and plowing up paddocks to use zero till practices? Yes, so I guess Peter, obviously, Peter used that word regenerative kind of different definitions too, because that's probably one of the challenges of regenerative ag is everyone comes to it with a slightly different perspective. But I guess, yes, one of the main common aims is to reduce the soluble fertilizers and one of my key principles of regenerative agronomy is to maximise what you've already got in your soil in terms of nutrients, so getting the nutrients to cycle better. Uh, so yeah, hopefully that's, um, and minimise disturbance. So yes, I agree with you there, Peter. Peter Smith, thanks very much for that. Um, no worries, Andy. Yeah, no worries at all. And Amanda put in there, uh, last comment there, missed the first half. Yeah, it'll be recorded, uh, Amanda. No worries. Um, great. So I think at that point I might pull up. Thanks, Camilla, and hand back to you, Kel. Thanks, David. That was a yeah fantastic introduction for everybody. I hope. Um, so yeah, has the slide there that everyone should hopefully be able to see now. You'll get a link in the next couple of days. 
so you can re-watch the recording at your leisure um, and there'll also be a link to a, a survey that we, we send out and would appreciate your feedback um, for future webinars that Local Land Services runs as a whole or for this webinar uh, in, gen in particular. Uh, David did make mention there about um, some source fact sheets. So there is a link there now that you could click, click to um, go to our local land services website, North Coast, and there's 11 different fact sheets on a whole range of soil topics. Uh, yeah, as David indicated, developed by Judy Earle um, from a previous project that we ran with her, and there's a one on uh, uh, the last one, number 12, is on grazing. Um, so what we're doing is we're starting to put together some um, some videos around some of those fact sheets as well, and we have one uh, on soil testing that's been done as well. So there's a couple of links there that you can follow. Um, if you missed that there, you can just go to our Lo North Coast Local Land Services page and you should be able to find things there. So on that note, I will uh, bring the, the webinar to a close and thank you to everyone for participating today and hanging in, and we'll let you know when the next one is. Thank you very much.